Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, July 29th. I'm Katie Balls, The Spectator's Deputy Political Editor, and I'll be your host for the next hour. On this week's show, how should we respond to the migrant crisis? More than 2,000 people illegally entered the UK across the Channel in June alone, a new record. I'll speak to Douglas Murray and the Refugee Council's Enver Solomon. And what's it like to make the journey? Ara Amerin, a Syrian actress who came to the UK on an American passport she bought for £500, will join us. Turning to COVID, why are cases falling so rapidly? Is it all good news? And should epidemiologists resist making really bold predictions? Oxford's Sinetra Gupta will be on the show to discuss. And then to the royals. Harry and Meghan have announced a full park book deal. Is this really the way to put the last few years behind them? And is that even their intention? Patrick Jefferson, who was private secretary to Princess Diana, will be on Spectator TV. Finally, is winning gold at the Olympics all that matters? I'll speak to Kath Bishop, a former GB Olympic rower. All that to come in the next hour. Before we get going, if you enjoy what we do on Spectator TV, then do subscribe to our YouTube channel. You do this by clicking the button at the bottom of the video and then tapping the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode ever again. And why not subscribe to The Spectator magazine too while you're at it? Get 12 weeks of the magazine for just £12 and we'll give you a free £20 Amazon voucher, completely free, uh, do the maths there. And that's three months of The Spectator delivered to your door and available online for just £12. Did we mention the voucher? Just go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer to take it up. Now first, Priti Patel has introduced a Nationality and Borders Bill, which could see refugees illegally coming into the UK jailed and border officers given powers to use force to keep illegal immigrants away. Is this the right approach? And if it is, is it enough? I'm joined now by Douglas Murray, who is in this week's cover piece, um, saying more needs to be done, and Enver Solomon, CEO of the Refugee Council. Douglas, Enver, thanks for coming on the show today. Douglas, to begin, in your cover piece, you note that the number of migrants has reached record levels. Can you talk us through why? Yes, of course. Uh, everyone will be aware that this story has been developing in recent years. Um, we have seen um, across Europe uh, in the last decade an increase in illegal crossings from principally uh, from Turkey and from North Africa into Mediterranean Europe. And we've seen a trickle uh, uh, in recent years of a similar movement across the English Channel from France to usually Dover or around the Dover area in the south of England. And uh, this movement has been a political issue of a kind for some time. Uh, viewers will remember that in 2018, the then Home Secretary Sajid Javid cut short his holiday to go and stare at the English Channel and, uh, um, and say that he was getting a grip on this issue. Uh, this issue, however, hasn't gone away, however much politicians stare at water. And uh, we've seen a very significant increase in the number of people coming illegally in uh, recent months. And I, it's important to get the figures in some perspective. Um, the number of migrants arriving uh, was four times higher last year than it was the year before. That it was, it was almost 2,000 people in 2019, and it was 8,500 in 2020. Now, the number for 2021 it having quadrupled last year, the number for 2021 is already double that uh, of last year. We, we've already seen in the first six months of this year more than 9,000 migrants arriving illegally by boat across the English Channel. And we've also seen the daily uh, um, records for that um, uh, exceeded with uh, a high in July of 430 people making the journey in just one day. Um, so this has become an issue which, uh, which politicians continue to pretend that they're going to uh, address and continue to not address. And as I say in the piece, if they don't, then the numbers will simply grow and grow because the pool uh, of people who wish to come to the UK and who might be attracted by this idea of a parallel asylum system, where on the one hand there's the legal system, on the other hand there's the first across the channel in, in a dinghy competition, uh, uh, the number of people willing to do that is vast across many continents in the globe. 
And so I suggest it's a massive issue that the, that the government needs to get a grip on. If it doesn't, it'll grow and grow and become worse for the government. And for, do you think it's an issue that more people are trying and succeeding in terms of crossing the channel? Well, it's important to put this in context. Uh, there are far fewer people coming to this country seeking asylum than there were a decade ago. We, we had a huge, far higher number, over 100,000 at one point when Tony Blair was Prime Minister. Last year, the numbers were down to around about 30,000. And if you look at the, the trend over the last five years, and as I say, over the last decade, it's a downward trend. Nevertheless, the numbers, as Douglas rightly says, coming across the channel have increased. And that, of course, poses a, cha pose, poses a big challenge for our government, and it would do for any government of, of any colour. Because when you have people coming across one of the world's busiest shipping lanes in very small boats, risking their lives, that, that is a, a huge issue and it, and it has to be addressed. But the context is really important here. The overall context is that the numbers coming to this country seeking asylum over the last few years and over the last decade has been declining and it's important to, to, to recognise that. Several, several things about that. One is, of course, it's not surprising that, that asylum claims were down last year because the, the, most of the world was in lockdown. Um, and it's, 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 it's very hard to draw the trajectory of the last decade, not least also because the, the movement you're talking about, of course, uh, in, the, in the previous decade under Labour was significantly to do with intra-EU migration. Uh, it was to do with the British government losing control of the British, Britain's borders, uh, in part because of our membership of the EU. One of the things that caused the British public to vote to leave the EU in 2016 was the idea that the British government would be more capable of controlling the British borders after leaving the EU than it was before. So that's why it's a particular political problem for this government. Uh, movement of migration ebbs and flows. But if after a government has been mandated by the public with, with tidying up its asylum and immigration system and in fact is seen to be losing control of it in such a visible way, uh, then I think this is a problem. And, and just one other point on this, which is that it's important, of course, to bear in mind that this whole issue of the signal that you give out as a, as a country. The people who are trying to cross the channel illegally at the moment have gone through multiple safe countries before doing so. Uh, they do not have to come to Britain. They are choosing to come to Britain. They do not have to pay the smuggling gangs thousands of pounds to go across the channel. They are choosing to do that and choosing to leave safe EU countries. And if the government in the UK encourages that movement, then as I say, the number of people who will like to follow is limitless because we are talking here not just about people who are fleeing, for instance, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, uh, but as we saw recently in the, in the surge of uh, arrivals the other week, uh, people from Vietnam, for instance. Now, there are people from sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, across the world, people who are suffering economic deprivation who would like to come to the UK and who the UK cannot allow to come. And we're just on that, um, Douglas, as he just... Uh put across there but also in his cover piece um, talks about the fact that uh, the current arrangement uh, privileges those who can afford entry can afford to make that journey and also encourages people smugglers um, do you agree with that look i think it's really important here to understand the context the, even when we had inward migration from the eu the, the main countries of those nationalities coming here seeking asylum were not from the European Union. That, that, was a, that was a separate migration challenge. This is an issue which goes back right to when this country, uh, and, it's, and, and we're talking about it on, on a very significant day, seven decades since this country, along with other countries, put its name to the UN Convention on Refugees. And Conservative Prime Ministers since Churchill, all the way up to David Cameron, have stuck to a very important principle and that principle is that those people who come to this country claiming that they need protection should be given a fair hearing on UK soil. And if they need protection, they should be given it. And if they don't need protection, they should be sent back. And indeed today, in the front line, in the fight against COVID, if you look at people working in the NHS, 
There are Afghan doctors who had no choice but to get here in the back of a lorry. There are people who came from Iran fleeing oppression, who are top level surgeons. And indeed, if you look across the arts, if you look across education, if you look across business, there are many refugees who are making an incredible contribution to this country, proud to be Britons, playing by the rules, paying their taxes and contributing to this country in an incredible way. And it's very important that as a nation, we continue seven decades after the UN Convention to stick to that key principle that, as I say, many Conservative Prime Ministers have continued to stick to, which is if you come here with a case for refugee protection, you are given a fair hearing. Um, there are two important things to say about that. The first is um, uh, just to address uh, the fiction that the arrivals coming over by boat uh, from France are all going to end up being surgeons, doctors, leading academics and statisticians and much more. And it's not the case. Uh, it's the fantasy of the pro-open borders lobby uh, that uh, everybody... Charles, can I just say, uh, can... uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I'm not advocating pro-borders. What I'm but simply just, advocating, well... if you let me finish, please, Charles, come on, you've, you've had a lot to say. Um, what I'm advocating I is the that. UN Convention on Refugees. Now, the UN Convention no. on Refugees, just let me finish, please let me make my point, I'm not interrupting you. The UN Convention on Refugees is very clear and it upholds the principle that if you are fleeing oppression, war, terror, and you come to this country, you can make a claim for protection. And indeed, we have done that for decades. There are many people across this country who have come from Afghanistan. Indeed, we, we brought together refugees early this week across seven decades, people that had fled Idi Amin in Uganda, people that had fled Hungary and the communist totalitarian regime, all individuals that came here made a claim for protection under the UN Convention and were given protection. What I'm advocating is that we adhere to that. By no means am I advocating open borders, because if people don't have a legitimate claim for protection or a need for protection, absolutely they should be sent back to the country from which they have come from, and well, they should be supported to do that. I'm very glad to hear you say that, but yet you're encouraging the breaking of the law and the breaking of the asylum procedures by advocating, or indeed encouraging, the illegal movement of people across the channel. And as I say, we have an asylum system. I think the it's UN Convention is not breaking the law. Please, you, you said a moment ago that you hadn't interrupted me and you just have again. It's extremely deleterious for our country to be in a situation where we encourage the breaking of the law by migrants who you then pretend afterwards are going to never break the law again and are all going to become doctors and surgeons. But let's just address the bigger issue, which is a fundamental one, which is that you know as well as I do that UN Convention for the UK is a polite fiction. It relies on the, 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 of it not being the case that very many people are going to make it to the UK and then claim asylum. The people you talked about who come from, for instance, Afghanistan, have, as I say, walked across multiple safe countries. They are looking at Europe as a buffet that they choose from, not as, an, as a haven to try to reach. And it is exceptionally important that we as a country understand this in the modern context. You keep talking about context. Let's address the context. The context we are in now is very different from that seven uh, decades ago. We have not just the ability to see how the rest of the world is living through our smartphones and much more, and people across Africa have these devices, but we can go and move around much more easily than at any time previously. In the current era, there are people from across the Middle East, the Far East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, all wishing to move to Europe, and Britain is one of the countries they would like to come to. One third of people in Sub-Saharan Africa, polled by Gallup last year, said they would like to move. They do not want to move to the Middle East, they want to move to Europe, they want to move northwards. Now, my suggestion is that in that context, Britain has to be realistic about what our capabilities are of providing a haven for the world's poor, dispossessed, and much more. I think we are a small country. We should have small ambitions about this. We cannot be the haven for anyone in the world who wishes to have a better life to come in and try to make that better life here. It's impossible. But as I say, we've been running on the polite fiction of recent decades, and I'd like us not to keep up that fiction. And Douglas, 
in your piece, you talk about the need for a tougher uh, response in terms of the government's response. Uh, what do you think they should be considering? A whole range of proposals. Uh, the first is they could follow the example the Greeks have set in the last couple of years and simply turn around the boats in the channel. That would be much preferable uh, to the British Coast Guard effectively acting as a wing of the smuggling operation by picking people up a few miles into the channel and then ferrying them to the UK. Uh, they could try to follow the Australian precedent and offshore people wishing to come, make sure that their applications are processed elsewhere than on British soil, uh, because as Enver knows, in actual fact, uh, once you're in, it's extremely hard for the British government to repatriate. It's, it's, it's all sorts of reasons why they don't do it and why it ends up not happening and being kicked down the road. And another option is to follow our um, colleagues and friends in Denmark, who have managed to introduce numerous restrictions in recent years uh, to ensure that uh, migration into Denmark has gone down by some like nine times in the last few years. Uh, so, you know, Australia, Greece, Denmark, these are all also very distinguished liberal democracies. They all have a fine liberal tradition and they've also realised that they can hold on to the principle of legality and of borders and that they can do so uh, without anyone but a very relatively small fringe of people claiming that they are some kind of beyond the pale countries. And for which of those options do you think has merit? Well, I, I think this is a, a global issue, very much in the way that climate change is a global issue. And of course, it's a challenge for every Western government when you have people who are being displaced on the scale that we do have globally today, you know, millions and millions of people being displaced through no fault of their own. And indeed, if there was displacement in Europe and Europeans were being subject to what is happening in other continents, I think Europeans would expect the rest of the world to respond in a compassionate way too. So globally, we have to think about how we address this huge challenge. And the challenge will continue, no doubt, going forward into to the future years, into the future decades. And it requires Western governments to come together in the way that they're doing over climate change and to think about a solution that reflects the principles that, that nations have abided by and stuck to and supported since the horrors of the Second World War. Principles that are about humanity, that are about recognising that we are a global community and we, we respond appropriately to support fellow humans when they're in crisis and when they're in need of support. Um, I agree that this is a global crisis, but I think that people talking about Britain's borders very rarely have any idea of the global scale of it. Uh, when people talk about the need for compassion and humanity, I don't think anyone is anti-compassion or anti-humanity. I think these are very easy ways to browbeat people into accepting the breaking of the laws of the country that they're in. It is not a British tradition or anything of which Britain needs to be proud to pretend that Britain is not Britain unless we allow the breaking of the law in our asylum and immigration policies. Uh, the fact that historically Britain has on occasion been able to give sanctuary to really very significantly small numbers of people in our history is a reflection that we're a small island with relatively small resources in the global scheme of things. And when people say that, that we need to come together to answer this, I agree with this. Britain, however, cannot be uh, the resort of choice for anybody in the world, as I say, we had the example of people coming from Vietnam again the other day across the channel. For anyone across the Far East, the Middle East, the Near East, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa and everywhere else in the world where they are not having the life they would like. Some people are fleeing war zones, absolutely. The majority are fleeing economic deprivation. And it is a very negative idea indeed, to my mind, to pretend and to console our consciences by pretending in any way that Britain can answer all of these problems. We cannot. What we can do is make things an awful lot worse in Britain and in France and in neighbouring EU countries by adhering to a polite lie that it is remotely in Britain's gifts to solve all of the problems that exist in the world. And as I say, in particular by pretending that as well as the legal asylum system we have, we should also have a parallel asylum system, an illegal one, where whoever gets across the channel first in a boat wins entry into Britain. I think it's a great mistake and the people who have been encouraging it will rue the day 
when this gets more out of control down the line. It is something that will need to be addressed. And if it isn't, we've seen in the last decade what happens. I've heard all of the arguments about compassion and humanity made by compassionate and pseudo humanitarian figures across Scandinavia, Mediterranean Europe. They all said in the last 10 years, let them come, let us answer the, the, the woes of the world. And then it got way out of hand and they had to crack down and snap back. Of course they did, because surprise, surprise, it's not in Denmark's gift to sort out the world's woes. It's not in Sweden's gift, not in Italy's gift, and it's not in Britain's either. It's it's in the world's gift to respond to global challenges in the way that we're responding to the climate challenge. And of course, it's in the world's gifts and, and the gift of, of democratic nations to respond to respond to, to this challenge. And I'm not suggesting that Britain opens it, its borders. I'm simply suggesting that as a nation, we uphold a principle that we have stuck to for seven decades, which is giving protection to those who need it. Those that come across the channel are not all economic migrants. Some of them will be, but if you look at the main nations that they're coming from, they're coming from Syria, they're coming from Eritrea, where there's a huge issue with refugee camps due to the war in, in Ethiopia and the struggle, the civil struggle in Ethiopia. They're coming from Iraq, we know the situation in Iraq, and they're coming from a highly oppressive regime in Iran. We need to give them the opportunity to have their case heard, and if they merit protection, we should give them protection in the way that we have done for many, many decades. And the communities that have settled in this nation as a consequence of our commitment to refugee protection have made a huge contribution to this nation. Indeed, if you look at parliaments, you could track back through many parliamentarians' lives and families, those refugees that have come here. Indeed, our Foreign Secretary, Dominic Rabb, is one example of that. And just finally on that, I mean, in your work, you uh, uh, offer support to uh, those coming to the country. What do you think uh, is the case when a, you know, reality meets uh, what people have expected in advance? I mean, the reality is all those people we, we work with, when, when they come here, whether that's through so-called regular routes or the irregular routes that, that Charles is so, uh, seems to be so angry about. You're fine, first of all, it's Douglas. When, 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 sorry, sorry, and Douglas. Sec <laughs> and secondly, that it's not the irregular route. Just, just let me finish. The, the irregular routes God, I just that want people to come get my name right first. Sorry, I, I do apologise. That was my oversight. It, it wasn't an in, intended... Uh, mistake. Sorry, Douglas. Um, those irregular routes that people come, come here to, um, whether that's from Afghanistan or other countries. Uh, what we find is, is when they arrive here, they are hugely grateful for the support that this country is offering them. And they want to make a contribution. They want to do right by this country and they simply want to rebuild their lives. They want to do the best for themselves and for their families. And they know that doing the best for themselves is by working hard and by making a contribution. And I think what stands out from research by ONS and by other reputable research agencies is that communities that have come and settled in this country are often the communities who are extremely hardworking, who do play by the rules, and who do pay their taxes and are upstanding citizens who want to contribute to this community to, to their communities and we need to recognize that you know i don't want to have an argument about what is true and untrue i want to have an argument about the reality based on our work and you know i'm sat here from leeds today uh, we're welcoming a family that's coming in from lebanon from a refugee camp today they will arrive they will be taken to a home in york supported by the council and I'm certain that that family will go on to make an active contribution to their community. I was reading the other day about the woman who leaves the conser who leave and has set up the conservative supporters and friends of Afghanistan. She came over here with her father in a refrigerator. Their only choice was to come on a so-called irregular route, what Douglas calls illegal routes. They came here and now they're making a huge contribution to this country. And it's important to reflect the reality of those stories in this conversation. Douglas Ender, thank you very much for coming on today. And if you enjoyed that discussion, we will be releasing the full unedited 40 minute discussion on the YouTube channel. Um, so do watch out for alerts, which you can get through subscription. So what is it actually like to enter the UK illegally? 
and what drives people to take the often perilous journey. I'm joined now by R.L. Merrin, an actress and refugee who came to the UK when ISIS took over her town in Syria. So, Awa, thank you very much for joining us today, along with your dog, Jacko, which we'll, we'll get to in due course. Um, I think to begin with, uh, you came as a refugee to this country, and I wondered if you could start by uh, telling uh, listeners and viewers uh, why you left Syria. Well, thank you for having me first. Uh, yeah, for sure, I left Syria for many reasonable questions. Thanks, you know, um, it was a war in Syria. I'm already Palestinian refugee in Syria. I was born and recognized as Palestinian refugee in Syria. My city called Yarmouk Camp City, which is ISIS, could get there. And we had to flee to Lebanon, actually, first. I wasn't planning to come to the UK. You know, we just fled me and my family to the nearest country back then in 2012 and that was Lebanon and then because our situation as Palestinian refugee was very hard in in Lebanon you know so sometimes we would be legal and give us you know three months for settle and sometimes wouldn't be legal because the government has different plan so we weren't you know stable so we spent six years in Lebanon, you know, being legal and illegal. I could actually find a way for myself because I was an actress then and uh, I worked some projects. So I could, you know, try to find a way to make myself a little bit settle. And anyway, then we had to return back in Syria 2018, trying probably, you know, the things getting better and like that. And uh, obviously the things was getting worse and we just faced very dangerous things. And personally, I couldn't be any more there. I had to flee as much as I could back to Lebanon and even Lebanon wasn't safe for me so I had to leave just and uh, I left and I came here to be safe for sure. And can you just talk us through the journey to the UK um, because what we've been discu uh, discussing uh, so far on Spectator TV and in the magazine this week is uh, crossing some ways to get here, which aren't obviously the conventional route, um, smugglers. And I wonder if you talk us through, through your journey here. Yeah, well, actually because of my special situation as Palestinian refugee, which is I don't have passport for any chance for visa or anything that I, I was actually looking for, you know, visa or anything that can get me legally to the country but that was impossible because i had travel document for palestinian refugee in syria which is lots of countries they are not welcoming this uh, so i had to deal with the smuggler because i had no way other than being uh, with the smugglers and walking through four countries actually to make my journey so I dealt with a smuggler. He um, was living in Kurdistan, Erbil, and uh, we dealt to help me to go to Erbil, Kurdistan, and from there walking to Turkey, and then from Turkey having another smuggler and walking from Turkey to Greece, and then from Greece dealing with another smuggler, you know, to from Greece to the UK. So. I feel like I, I wanna fled from Syria because of the dangers, the danger things there, because of the situation. And then I had to deal with more dangerous people, you know, just because I had only this option to do this. Anyway, uh, the journey had took a month and 25 days to be in the UK. And thank God that I could make it because I didn't think that I'm going to be survived through the jungles and mountains and rivers. And why did you decide to come to the UK? Was it always the UK that you wanted to head towards? Um, you've spoken about how there are obviously other countries on your journey to get here. 
Well, actually, when I was um, uh, 10 years old, that was the first time I learned about English language as a foreign language, and suddenly I had chemistry with the language. And, you know, because USA and UK, you know, spoke this specific language, I didn't know why I was really interested of the language first. Then, later on, when I decided, because I actually studied law before studying acting, when I studied acting as an actress, I decided to improve my language. And then the destiny just led me in Lebanon to work with BBC, a project, and uh, BBC Arabic and BBC Media Action. So, and I met the uh, lovely British people around and then suddenly I met a nice man, British, in Lebanon too. So it seems that the destiny, you know, led me to the UK. And just to mention, I came to the UK with an American passport for a, another lady. So I got chance to go to USA, but because I felt something, I don't know, like just, let me go to the UK because of my experience with BBC because I got boyfriend you know because the language I don't know I felt safe I feel more safe in the UK than any another country and then once you were here how did you find the process of you know uh, joining British society <sighs> well um, it's not easy I mean Okay, I just arrived. I thank God I'm here safe, but then just the process gets started and I just treat it as a number, you know, I mean asylum seeker process is I don't know, but actually affect me mentally, psychologically. I try to be active and busy all the time, but because I'm kind of educated person, so I can aware I'm very aware about the process like it's not fair, you know, I mean, I'm a number and I'm just waiting like others and, you know, we've got 37 pounds per week. I'm not complaining, by the way. I mean, I know, but it's not like it's hard process and to wait. There's no one will tell you how much for how long you will wait. No one will mention when you will be settled down. It's, you know, I mean, I just, just wait. I'm here, but for me it wasn't enough. Anyway, I did my best when I was asylum seeker. So straight away I volunteered with Red Cross and another three local uh, organizations, including Refugee Council in Rotherham, South Yorkshire. And I did interpreting course, I did social courses because I knew myself, I've got trauma after the journey. The process here as asylum seeker affecting me. I mean, I used to be a refugee before for all my life, but that was first time facing to be asylum seeker, which is really, I mean, I'm, I'm sensitive already. And that I think affect me for a while, you know, I told you, I tried to keep myself busy because this is the best, but then I knew like this, it's something missing about the process as an asylum seeker. And uh, because I got quite good lifestyle before, so I felt like I was struggling a little bit. And uh, yeah, but I cut up, I cut up, I had to cut up. Yeah, and uh, I was asylum, recognized as asylum seeker for 11 months. You know, I mean, I did my interview after four months and then I kept waiting for the an answer for seven months while others people get their answer after five days or three days, you know, or two months. So I, I had to wait seven months to get my answer. And I mean, mentally, I was thinking, what's the problem of my case, of me as a human being? Why? It's so clear, I, I came from the war, I'm already recognized as stateless person, you know. Anyway, so um, yeah, I just moved on now. I'm a refugee.
Now, the government is looking at uh, toughening up the rules around migrants entering the UK illegally. Um, so it would make that the routes harder than they even are now. Um, how does that make you feel? Well, I do believe because I'm part of that process, fleeing asylum seeker refugee, I do believe that everyone who put the life in risk just because there's no choice, no other choice. I know the government trying to do the best for the country. I know that. I don't want to be involved in political rules or laws. This is not my business, but I feel sorry. I mean, I feel sorry because I do believe a human being has, has how can I say, has a right to live in any safe place that feels this is safe, this is the best. You know, I mean, why not? I just can't understand why not. I mean, even because they didn't give any other options. I mean, for me, if I had an option to get to the UK legally, I would not say no. And just walking through the jungles, you know what I mean? I mean, I just had no choice. And others too, they had no choice. They, they are fleeting. Thanks for joining us, Awa. And remember, we have a special offer. If you subscribe to The Spectator magazine today, get 12 weeks of the magazine for just £12, along with a £20 Amazon voucher, free. That's three months of The Spectator delivered to your door and available online for just £12. And that is spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. Now to COVID. To the surprise of many, COVID cases across the UK are on the decline. Could the pandemic really be coming to an end? Have you reached herd immunity? Or are people just getting a little bit too excited too early? Professor Sinetra Gupta from the University of Oxford is on the show now. Sinetra, thanks for coming on. Ministers are taking hope from the fact there is now a clear downward trend in COVID cases. What do you think is behind it? And is this good news? Uh, well, I think that, of course, it's good news because um, what it does is it starts... Uh, what it does is it allows us to start thinking about the different hypotheses about why cases go up or down at all. And where we were at last year uh, was a situation where we didn't have enough data, uh, naturally the, the experiments hadn't been done, to help us discriminate between two different hypotheses. And that's where the battle has been um, over the last you know, year or so is um, in trying to determine which of the two competing hypotheses is correct. And what I said, you know, a year and a half ago now almost, was really that we should be extremely cautious about using mathematical models to predict the course of the um, pandemic and also to make policy decisions. Because what we have here now is from various countries a rise and fall and uh, interesting epidemic pandemic patterns and as i've said there are two competing hypotheses about why these are happening one is that they're entirely due to um, the effects of masks and lockdowns and other non-pharmaceutical interventions and we've seen a lot of models that have appear to validate that, but they don't actually. What they do is they throw out a testable hypothesis about whether these things work or not. On the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, several uh, groups, including our own, saying that, well, actually, we have to also consider the effects of uh, naturally acquired immunity, of herd immunity, of seasonality, and factors that are not related to uh, these uh, imposed restrictions. The truth, of course, lies somewhere in between, but both of these activities are actually just hypothesis-generating activities. So you know that it could be the um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, it could be herd immunity, seasonality. Only data can tell us where we lie within that continuum. And uh, what I would say now is we have what we're seeing with the cases falling now, or this downward trend, 
is that the effects of these NPIs are limited and the main drivers are actually naturally acquired immunity in the population or to obviously now vaccine induced immunity uh, which is unfortunately probably quite transient but it's there the signature is there and, and seasonality and we've had a piece on coffee heads this week by Oliver Johnston, the statistician, and he has uh, ultimately said that it might be too early to celebrate or not to, or in a way don't get ahead of ourselves when it comes to making predictions in terms of the uh, whether the third wave is over because it could in a way be peaks and troughs. And he's talking about a local maxim compared to a, a global one. Um, something we saw in Bolton where cases went down and then they went back up. So do you think this means it's too early to really know what's going on given that if we look at the 19th of July easing, that wouldn't necessarily feed in just yet? Uh, absolutely not. I think that what, what's happening here is you have, and, and something that's been ignored, is that there is a lot of, uh, there are regional differences. So it, it makes absolutely, I agree with Oliver in that it doesn't make any sense to uh, make grand sweeping statements on the basis of countrywide data. So, you know, last year people were saying, oh, there's only 6% seropositivity in the country. And there are two things wrong with that. One is that they were not taking into account that antibody levels decline very rapidly after infection. And more uh, pertaining to the question you just asked, there is no point lumping together all the data from different regions. And our own work showed last year that while um, people may have been highly exposed in London, for example, it was clear that Scotland had not suffered the same level of exposure. Um, and probably lockdowns consolidated that. So yes, uh, and, and not surprisingly, that's where we saw infections creep up immediately as soon as restrictions started to be lifted. So it's not as complicated as people want to think it is now that they're very simple models only, including um, farm interventions and restrictions don't explain it. It is still simple but it, it is a simple mix of herd immunity, seasonality, and some effect of these um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, as well as a transient effect of vaccine-induced immunity on blocking infection. Now, just to be clear, vaccine-induced immunity is fantastic and hopefully um, long, I mean, durable, lifelong, when it comes to protecting against severe disease and death. But I suspect some of the increase that we're see seeing now is due to the waning of the infection blocking part of vaccine induced immunity. And I think one of the reasons it feels as though uh, many in Westminster have also sign scientists and scientific advisors have been caught by surprise on the drop in daily cases we've seen in, in parts of the week is that we've had quite bold predictions. So you had Professor Neil Ferguson, I think just around a week ago, saying it was almost certain to reach 100,000 cases a day and there was a good chance actually you could even get to 200,000 a day. Now, They've dropped, uh, uh, you know, below 50. Uh, you know, we're looking at 20 something thousand a day in some cases. What do you think uh, has led that person to make such a bold prediction um, when that is not corresponding with the, what we're seeing now? As I've said over and over again, and, and my whole, um, you know, involvement in all of this from March of last year was to stress that models are absolutely crucial and invaluable as tools for generating testable hypotheses. They should never be used to predict and also policy, while they should be used as a basis for formulating policy, they should not there they should not be treated as truth in any sense. So what we have are different hypotheses. As I said, we've got a hypothesis that lockdowns work and everything uh, you know is is due all the uh, fluctuations we're seeing are due to these mandated um, restrictions and then on the other hand we have this other hypothesis that maybe they are due to natural immunity accruing in the population despite these restrictions and only data can tell us where the truth lies. I think the data right now are telling us that natural immunity, herd immunity, 
plays an enormous role, a very important role in bringing down infection. And we've seen that over the world. I mean, uh, all over the world, there are places where uh, lockdowns are effectively impossible to implement. And we know that natural immunity plays can, even in those circumstances, bring infections down. Now, what, of course, we needed to do was recognise all of that and come up with a policy that was robust to all these uncertainties. And what we suggested last year, which was to focus protection on the vulnerable, would have done that. It would have avoided all the uncertainties um, that models have in, in terms of actually throwing out real numbers about how things are going to be. So what's happening now is not a surprise. Uh, there are different models, different hypotheses. The data are coming in. What we need to do now, instead of arguing amongst ourselves, is just to sit back and say, OK, which of the different competing hypotheses do these data support? It's a rational exercise that should be executed with calm and without this idea that there is some sort of conservation of virtue here and that someone just because someone was wrong or right when it came to the hypotheses that they are either a good or bad person. Do you think then that perhaps when we're having these debates and particularly uh, with COVID we're hearing more when it comes to these hypotheses, uh, you know, competing theories, um, that there is a responsibility, I suppose, to be, to be a little bit less certain in the language we use. Um, because it's interesting because overnight Nate Silver, so uh, the famous US uh, pollster uh, who has got many things in his right right in this time, but also something's wrong, has been quite critical of Neil Ferguson's language, uh, saying that uh, you shouldn't have a situation where someone is uh, so uh, keen to say that they're, they're definite when you're doing uh, predictions, um, just because it is such a complicated thing to do. It's not, it's not complicated, it's just that there is a confusion between hypothesis and prediction. Uh, the models that Neil and, and uh, well, the, the so-called mainstream um, com modelling community were producing were all um, generally self-consistent hypotheses about how uh, mandated NPIs might bring down infection. So they, in those models they uh, assumed that closing schools would have some effect and then they fed it into the model and they showed that that could indeed explain uh, some of the patterns that uh, they had that were, had been observed up to, that, up to that point. So what they actually were doing were producing a self-consistent testable hypotheses. Now, where that went wrong and people started treating them as uh, predictions, I don't know, and it's not for me to assign blame on that. But it was not right. That's not part of the scientific procedure. What they should always have been presented as were testable hypotheses. Uh, as indeed on our side, saying that, look, uh, we think that actually a lot of this is due to uh, the accumulation of herd immunity and seasonality. That too is a hypothesis. So what we need to do now is all sit back and just say, uh, let's wait for the data to come in and then we can decide which of these um, is more likely to be correct. And in the meantime, we need to follow policies that are robust, as I said, to these uncertainties and also are cognizant of the huge harm done by um, such measures as lockdown. And, and these, th these are all simple precepts. Uh, I think people are falling back upon, oh, this is all very complex, we can't do this, we can't do that. Well, we knew that. You never use models to make specific predictions. You use them to generate testable hypotheses. Uh, they did that, we did that. Now let's wait and see what the data say. Thanks, Anetra. Next, Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, have announced a four-part book deal. The couple previously said they wanted to abandon royal duties to get more privacy. Is this the best way to do that? Patrick Jefferson, who worked as Princess Diana's private secretary between 1988 to 1996, says the pair need to be less confrontational. He's on the show now. Patrick, thank you for joining me today. Can you start by telling us about the book deal? The news comes out in dribs and drabs from uh, Sussex headquarters. I think that, that there has been some exaggeration around the amounts 
the amount of money that's, that's changing hands and the, the precise composition of the, uh, the publishing deal. Um, I don't know how much of that is deliberate and how much of it is just uh, um, because nobody really knows what's going on. But there's definitely going to be one book um, and publishing being the business it is, I'm quite sure that uh, uh, Penguin Random House um, have got it nailed down pretty precisely what it is they're expecting for what is rumored to be um, at least $20 million, maybe as much as $40 million. Who knows? And you wrote a while ago about um, why uh, Harry and Meghan ought to consider a less confrontational approach to the media. Now, there's various rumours already circulating with almost a year to go to the first book's publication about what might be in it. But one of it is uh, lots of angry uh, thoughts about the press. So do you think they've taken your advice? Uh, taking advice is something that royal people can... Um, uh, really do on their own terms. They can take it if they want it and they, they can ignore it um, if, they, if they want it. I doubt very much if they're taking my advice, but uh, the, 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 the object of writing about them is hopefully to make sure that some um, of one's own experience gets through to the advisors. I mean, I was an advisor to Harry's mother for eight years and um, some of the experience I gained that in that time is of some relevance potentially to them. It's also um, of relevance to people who perhaps want to put what's going on in some sort of context. There's a risk that it all gets turned into a distant extension of the entertainment industry. You can see from magazines and newspapers that the, the people writing about Harry and Meghan are not court correspondents in the traditional sense. They're entertainment uh, and society correspondents. They um, have successfully completed the transition of royalty from from uh, great affairs of state to uh, gossip and, and Hollywood tittle-tattle, which is um, perhaps good if you sell magazines and advertising, but it's, it's not very good for the status, particularly the international standing of the monarchy. Now, you mentioned Princess Diana and your work for her. Do you see any parallels in terms of her approach to the media um, compared to Harry and Meghan's? Well, the most obvious difference is that Princess Diana didn't invest heavily in a public relations consultancy. Uh, her husband did, her sons have, she never did. She never even had a full-time press secretary. When we needed a press secretary, we borrowed one from Buckingham Palace for overseas tours and things. So our philosophy was that um, uh, people saw nice images of what Princess Diana was doing. Um, and that was the message. If you want to know what Princess Diana thinks is important, what she's doing, where she's going, look at the pictures. And that is a very effective way of conveying a message. If you have to resort to paying big money for top level PR advisors, news managers, spin doctors, then you really ought to be looking more closely at the message you're trying to convey. The British people in particular, but this is a worldwide audience, aren't mugs. They can't be um, persuaded indefinitely of something that isn't true. So if you're spending lots and lots of money on PR, you need to be looking more closely at the way you're doing your business, the stuff you're doing, the principles you're, uh, you're upholding, and really um, the whole uh, um, concept you have of your own reason for existence and why it is that you're royal and not something else. Do you think there's a risk of overexposure for Prince Harry? Not really. Um, it appears that, that, that he and, and uh, Meghan are in the business of, of publicising themselves. Um, it's ironic that on the one hand they can claim they want privacy uh, and yet on the other hand spend an awful lot of time and a lot of money publicising themselves. And the, the secret here is that and they're not alone in this. A lot of royal people, uh, in my experience, have the same um, dilemma in a way. They, they want publicity, but they want good publicity. They want the cameras around, the press around, when they have something to say or they're doing something that they want the public to see. They don't want the press around, and least of all do they want cameras around, when they're doing something they don't want the public to see. Um, that is what they mean by privacy. It comes down to control. They want to control what we see of them, 
what we hear about them, what we understand about them, and really our opinion of them. And I suppose when we're looking at this four-part series now, we know there's the first book from Prince Harry. There's also talk of Meghan Markle penning a book uh, on uh, lifestyle. And then there's uh, rumours uh, of another book from Prince Harry after Her Majesty has passed away. Um, what do you think are the risks with their approach to this? Do you think that this is something where we've seen how the British audience at least seem to be turning away in some parts from uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle? Look at her book sales, for example. But yet in the US, they seem to be gaining support. Yes, there's no doubt that Harry and Meghan have caught the zeitgeist, you know, the spirit of the times. Um, although they are both uh, on the cusp of middle age, they nevertheless appeal to a young demographic a progressive demographic, a, um, one could say, uh, a feminist um, audience. And um, that contrasts pretty sharply with, I suppose, um, people like me, his mother's generation, who perhaps see things rather differently. The, the purpose is plainly to make money, um, lots of money to be self-sufficient, to live a very agreeable lifestyle. Uh, and there's no doubt they have to square their own consciences between what um, uh, they're prepared to reveal and what the publishers and their publicists expect them to reveal. One of the problems is that if you, if you spend a lot of money hiring a spin doctor, then unsurprisingly, they're gonna work very hard for you. It's like if you, you, know, if you're a, if you make shortbread and you get the contract to supply organic shortbread to Clarence House, you know, you're gonna give them your best shortbread. If you are a spin doctor, you give them your best efforts, this is going to be your career too. So um, uh, if you engage people like that, their interests are not going to be the same as necessarily your where your royal duty lies and how you, how you manage that conflict in your own mind as much as in public perception, um, I think is uh, perhaps the biggest test that, that, that Meghan and Harry face at the moment. Thanks for your time, Patrick. Finally, is winning gold everything? Britain is doing brilliantly so far at the Olympics, but some have said there's no reason to celebrate winning silver or bronze. Gold is all that matters, whether it's pride or money. Is this the right approach? Kath Bishop went to three Olympics in Team GB's rowing team, and she joins me now. Kath, you've attended not one but three Olympic Games, and you won a silver medal in one of those. Can you explain what makes the Olympics so different to other competitions? So it is the pinnacle for most sports. It does very little bit for, uh, depending whether you're a tennis player or a rower, but for most sports, the Olympics is the absolute pinnacle. It only comes around every four years. And of course, this time it's actually been five years. So you never actually know if you're gonna have more than perhaps one shot, maybe two. Um, okay, some rowers have I go to more Olympics, but you never know if an injury or something else will take you out. So it is the top level. The whole world watches an Olympics in the way that they don't watch an individual sports world championships. And it represents, you know, their exploration of human possibility, the boundaries that are broken in front of us all, but with a hell of a lot of pressure that comes with that. There's obviously going to be a Games quite soon around the corner uh, because of the timings of this one. Um, but I wonder what you made of some of the discussion this week about uh, what medal counts, because you had Piers Morgan, who, as far as I know, has not won an Olympic medal, um, saying only a gold medal will do, uh, which some people had, were quite quick to criticise him for. But I thought it was interesting that James Cracknell, um, also, uh, like you, uh, a rower, has come out and said that when it comes to what lots of athletes need from this Games, you do need a, a gold rather than a silver or a bronze because that's what gets you coverage, it's what gets you on the front of a newspaper, and importantly, it's what gets you sponsorship deals. Um, so he said it may sound brutal, but gold is what it has to be. Um, what do you make of that? So I think there were two really interesting and, and, uh, and key points to challenge there. I mean, firstly, with Piers Morgan, it's a very tired, macho narrative, isn't it? That gold is everything. There's only one winner. And I think, you know, maybe that was suitable for the world a century ago when we fought conventional battles and, and life was simple and we were just trying to, you know, be a bit more uh, efficient in our economic output. But the world is a lot more complex than, than that in the 21st century. We're, we're not trying to just beat other people. We're trying to explore what's possible in sport, in business, in the environment to solve issues of social inequality as well as climate change. So a binary mentality like that is pointless. We lose talent if we do that. 
and every Olympic winner comes out of a great race and you need to have more than one person in that race for it to be the thrilling drama that we watch. So I wish we would look and appreciate all of the, you know, the tactics that happen within the race, the risks, the decisions, the teamwork, all that's going on within the race and not just judge things from one snapshot, just that second crossing the line because we lose out on the human story, which actually is what I think has us gripped when we've all been watching these dramas unfold over the last few days. And I think with James, the interesting question there is, what is it that drives an elite athlete? Are they there to get sports coverage on a newspaper? I don't think that's actually the purpose of a lot of elite athletes. It certainly wasn't my purpose. I'm not sure it's a really healthy one either. I think it's about, again, exploring your, your boundaries, your mental and physical boundaries, pushing your sport forward, seeing what's possible and being part of a journey to um, you know, learn resilience, learn teamwork, demonstrate those skills to others, be role models you know, in the way that the England football team were in terms of advocating for a fairer society. There's so much more that sport could and should be about in my view, than just about how much uh, column coverage you're getting and, and how much sponsorship may or may not result from that. And you mentioned the England team and how perhaps the high profile that uh, athletes, sports star now has, mean that they can have that reach. We see more political interventions, but do you think it's fair to say the number one goal of an athlete though should be their sport performing well? So I think you're right, it's about performance, but then we have a debate about what helps you to perform best. And what I think we've seen is that sometimes when you over-specialise on your sport, you do nothing else. Actually, you can't perform as well because you lose perspective. You don't have anything else in your life. So if you don't win the Olympics or if you're having a bad training day, your whole world falls apart. And that's not good for your mental health, nor for your performance over time. So I think there is this rebalancing now about what does a healthy performance approach look like that will both get you your best performance, but in a way that doesn't leave you with a lifelong mental health issue, um, you know, or or other challenges along the way. And I think then it is actually good for um, a sports person to have an identity beyond sport. Again, we see that real crisis that if you fail and you actually think the sport is defining who you are, then you suddenly think you literally have no worth as a human being. And that's not healthy. It's not right. It doesn't make sense. And again, it doesn't actually give you your best performance over time either. And and when it came to your Olympic medal, the silver medal, how did that change your life? Uh, Were you elated when you won that? Were you, uh, uh, did you see things measurably change in the coming weeks? So I had really mixed emotions. I won a silver medal and I was part of that environment, you know, along with people like James Cracknell saying it's not good enough, you know, first loser, uh, only gold counts. So, you know, there was a part of my brain that had learnt those mantras and I thought, oh dear, I've sort of failed at the last hurdle. There's another part of my brain going, well, actually, I came seventh and ninth in the previous Olympics, so I'm delighted to be on the podium. I'm also aware and proud that I gave everything that I had on that day. Um, and there's loads of stuff that it take with me afterwards. So, you know, my medal is, is beautiful. I love it. It's tucked away in a drawer. But the things that I take with me every day are the way I learned to work in a team, the resilience that I built, the relationships. You know, when we get together, we don't talk about our medals. We talk about, you know, all those just kind of incredible moments of bonding, the training camps, the dark times, the funny times, those experiences. Those are the things that have really lasting value. And it's interesting uh, when we're talking about that mentality of, you know, gold medals or nothing, um, because when you're talking about uh, mental health and being so focused, I couldn't help but think of Simone Biles, who is the uh, female US gymnast, very high hopes for her. She has, um, she withdrew uh, from the group competition uh, after performing in one act and the US team went on to win silver. Now, lots of people thought they were going to win gold, but uh, the messaging out after that, uh, the girls are pretty happy with silver. And if you see uh, some of those young female gymnasts taking to social media saying, you know, actually silver's what they, what they you know, something that they are delighted with and they're not going to have comparisons of gold. Do you think we're seeing a bit of a shift in terms of athletes talking about their mental health, but also perhaps being less focused or uh, uh, less competitive in that sense? 
I hope so. I think we are. I think athletes understand that in order to perform, they've got to be less obsessed about the medals. Sports psychology actually teaches us to separate out the concepts of performance and results. We can't control the results. They depend on things you know, that, that we don't control, like how our competitors do, or sometimes you know, referee decisions, as we saw in Taekwondo. So all we can do is bring our best performance. And that's what we have to measure ourselves on. And then when we get the result, we assess and think, where can I improve and, and go again? And that's a healthy way that gets you your best performance stops you obsessing about something that you cannot guarantee and so I think we see athletes now talking in that language what hasn't always caught up is the kind of media uh, the media and the commentators the narrative who don't really understand that separation it's a separation that's also really important in business in organizations where equally business results aren't within our control and depend on lots of external factors and what we have to focus on is all of the things that can en- enable us to deliver the best organizational performance so it, it's a it's a formula that works well and i think you know those who start to understand that see the benefits and, and therefore keep going. And, and so we start to hear that slightly different narrative where it's not just all about gold. It's actually about that performance over time within the perspective, within the context within which that performance took place. And just finally, um, Kath, while we have you here, you, uh, you know, uh, were, were someone who rode at the Olympics, but since then you've had quite a shift in career. You've gone on to work in diplomacy. I just wondered if you could talk us briefly through uh, what inspired you to do that. So I studied uh, languages and international politics. So I always had an interest in the world of yeah, international diplomacy. And, and so for me, it was, you know, another ambition, if you like, another area that I wanted to pursue. And, uh, you know, first of all, I got taken off on this incredible journey of, of being an Olympic rower. And that actually went on longer than I thought as I was chasing for that best performance. Um, and then I was really fortunate to, to have, you know, something else to throw myself into. And I actually now work in leadership development coaching, which actually draws on both those careers, which were high pressure careers, working in teams, trying to deliver results and actually trying to work out what does success look like? You know, if you're negotiating in a really messy situation, then, you know, where, where are we trying to get to? How do we get all of us to buy into a picture of success that we can all connect with rather than a zero sum game? Who's the winner? Who's the dominant? Who's the Piers Morgan winner? Uh, you know, gold medalist here. That, that logic didn't help in the diplomatic world either. And I think it doesn't help in most of the worlds that we operate in. Kath, thank you for joining us today. And that's it for the week. If you enjoyed this episode, you guessed it, you should subscribe to The Spectator's YouTube channel so you never miss an episode again. Just click subscribe at button at the bottom of this video and the bell icon to make sure you never miss it. Thanks for watching and do join us again next week.